Um, all right. So tonight, our brother Luis, uh, Jose Luis, is going to be sharing his testimony with us, the story of God's work in his life. Um, and therefore, the sermon is going to be shorter than usual so that Jose Luis has time to share his story with us. Um, <clears throat> but I do want to share from God's Word some reflections, some thoughts about what God's Word says about immigration and refugees and the expanding family of God. Now, last week, our sermon was about the heavenly worship service that we're going to be in one day, that all of God's people will experience one day in heaven. In Revelation 7, 9 through 10, the Apostle John wrote, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. They were from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So that's our destiny, friends. That's where we're going. Anyone on earth who trusts in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior will go to heaven and will worship with that congregation. And that's what we'll do forever, forever. But when we look around the world today, what do we see? We see division and conflict. And it has to make us wonder, how could that heavenly vision ever actually happen? Is it possible for people of different cultures, different languages, different nations, could they really be united in one congregation Worshipping the same God. You know, throughout much of history, and in many parts of the world, it was believed that religion and nationality go together. Religion and nationality always go together. Faith and ethnicity were considered inseparable. The nation of Israel struggled with this also. They had that mindset thousands of years ago. But they, of all people, should have known better about God's heart. Because it was God's plan from the very beginning to draw people from every corner of the earth who would all worship him in spirit and in truth. God started with one family. He started with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And from them, he built a nation. And that nation was intended to be a city on a hill, a light shining to the nations. God's people were called to be a lighthouse, a lighthouse that would call lost sinners in danger to come and find shelter in the Lord. God explains that vision in Isaiah 49, 6. He said, it's too small a thing. God doesn't do small things. He says, it's too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and bring back the preserved of Israel. That's too small. He said, I will make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So how does the good news reach the ends of the earth? There's at least two ways, right? One is that messengers carry the good news to the nations. And people have been doing that for hundreds of years. The Lord also, the second thing, is the Lord relocates people through migration. Look at Acts 17, these two verses. It says, from one man, that's Adam, from one man God made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history, and the boundaries of their lands. And God did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, although he's not far from any of us. You see, God is behind where people live and where people move. That's the point. The story of the Bible is all about migration. It's all about the relocation of people. In the past year, we've seen thousands of Afghan refugees move into the Washington, D.C. area. Before the Afghans, we saw thousands of Syrians who were escaping the civil war in Syria. 
And did you know 40 years ago, one million refugees from Vietnam fled their country and settled in the United States. And thousands of them settled right here in this neighborhood where we are. So people have been moving around the planet throughout human history. It began all the way in the beginning. Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. They were migrants. Later, God told Abraham in Genesis 12 to leave his homeland. And Abraham was a wanderer and a migrant for the rest of his life. Abraham's great-grandson, Joseph, he was a victim of human trafficking, sold into slavery by his own brothers. And then Joseph's family became economic refugees because of a famine. And then Joseph's family moved to Egypt. They immigrated. They got their green cards printed on papyrus, right? And they were enslaved for 400 years in Egypt. But the movement wasn't over. Moses led them out of Egypt. And they spent 40 years wandering around the desert of Sinai before they entered the Promised Land. Now, much later, jumping ahead, God's people were exiled from that land because of their idolatry and their rebellion. But God was with them. The faithful ones who were exiled discovered they could worship God in Babylon, of all places. They could still worship him because the king of the universe refuses to be confined to one building, to one people, to one denomination, to one country. He's not going to let himself be limited that way. Now, what limits us is our sin. Our sin separates us from God. It separates us from God because he is holy and righteous. We become spiritual refugees. That's how we're all born. We're spiritual refugees because we want to live on our own. But God doesn't wait for us to find our way back to him. That's how much he loves us. The Good Shepherd comes to find and rescue spiritual refugees, like me, like you. In John 14, 23, Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. We will come to you. You see that? He doesn't say, come to me. He, you know, he says that sometimes too. But he says, we will come to you. We will make our home with you. Friends, all of us spend our lives searching, searching for a safe place, seeking a home for our hearts. We have restless hearts. I was an atheist for 10 years. I was trapped in the desert of my own pride and arrogance. And I have to ask, haven't you wandered in the desert in your life? Haven't you followed the faulty compass of your sin and wandered the desert in your way? Haven't you chased after pleasure or power or anything that would promise you security, escape, and peace? See, every human heart has a vacant room in it, an empty place that stays vacant until Jesus moves in. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to you, and I will eat with you, and you with me. See, Jesus offers to enter into our hearts and make us clean from the inside first, and then outside. But the thing that turns the key, the thing that opens our hearts to Jesus, is a very simple prayer. You simply pray, Jesus, I'm sorry for all my sin, all my sin that caused you to die on the cross. And I trust in you, and I believe you died for me. And so please come, make me new. Come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. See, Jesus knocks on the door of the heart of people from every nation, in every language, in every corner of the earth. And he has brought 
many of those people from every corner of the earth into these neighborhoods. Many into this church. Many who would never hear the good news in their home country. And maybe that's why God relocated them. And so we're building a church here that loves our new neighbors. We want to see these words from Isaiah 56 come true. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants. These, these foreigners, these strangers, I will bring to my holy mountain, and I'll give them joy in my house of prayer. And my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Amen. Jesus died to give this church the joy and privilege of being a house of prayer for all nations. Jesus, you know, he was the ultimate foreigner. He was the ultimate stranger. It was his love for strangers and foreigners like us that motivated him to migrate from heaven to earth. John 1 says he came to live among his own people and they wouldn't receive him. They rejected him. When Jesus was a child, his family became refugees. They had to avoid political persecution and go to Egypt. And you know, some of you are here for the same reason. Some of you have fled political persecution in your home countries, and that's why you're here. When Jesus was an adult, persecution continued because he was teaching about the kingdom of God in a way that angered the men in power. To keep their grip on power, they plotted and lied to have Jesus murdered. But even this was a part of God's plan. And it was a plan that had you and me as the objective of the plan. Do you remember when Jesus flipped tables at the temple? You know that story? He was angry. He was angry about what was happening in the court of the Gentiles. And it was this area around the temple that was built for non-Jews. People who didn't know about Yahweh. Immigrants. Strangers. It was the place where they could come and learn about God. But greedy religious leaders had pushed out the Gentiles. Listen to Matthew 21, verse 12. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. See, Jesus was angry because the temple was being used for profit, not prophecy. The temple community was supposed to be an international community. Jesus established his church to accomplish that vision, to offer a foretaste of the worshipful experience in heaven. And so this global expansion, I'm just kind of going through God's word here. This global expansion of God's kingdom, we see it really explode in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, Jesus told his apostles that they were going to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. And then in Acts 8, Philip the deacon shares the gospel with the Samaritans and then with a court official from Ethiopia. And Philip baptizes him and this Ethiopian man takes the gospel to the continent of Africa. And then Paul takes the gospel to Turkey and Greece and Rome, and he was planning to go to Spain. We don't even know if he made it. Thomas probably went to India with the gospel. So the gospel spread to foreign lands, and everywhere it went, people were reborn when they trusted in the name of Jesus Christ. And today, God's people continue to carry this good news to foreign lands, and God also brings people from around the planet, so that some of them will hear the gospel for the first time in their new home. Why does God do all this? To make us brothers and sisters. We have different color skin, beautiful different skin colors and eye colors. We speak different languages. We speak with different accents. And we have the same father. We're a family. 
We're united to Christ through repentance and faith because Jesus came to find lost sheep, people like me, people like you. He welcomes spiritual refugees and he makes them citizens, citizens of God's kingdom. United in him, we become God's dwelling place. Listen to this in 1 Corinthians 3.16. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple, singular, of God, and that the Spirit of God lives in you? We are joined together into one temple, my friends. We are the dwelling place of God. He inhabits our worship. And that's why we need each other in this church. We need different kinds of people from different nations to complete the body of Christ, to represent the image of God completely. Professor Andrew Walls says this. I love it. He says, The Ephesian metaphors of the temple and the body show that each culture is necessary to the body, and each culture is incomplete in itself. Only in Christ does the image of God dwell completely and fully. Only together are we complete in Christ. I believe that. So friends, one day we're going to worship together in heaven, as we talked about last week. When all the nations are gathered and they're singing the praises of the Lamb, I can't say this will happen, but I, I, I have a hunch that the Lord might go over to Abraham. And he might go over to Abraham and put his arm around Abraham's shoulder. Say, Abraham, you remember the promise I made to you? Remember I was going to make all those stars, all those people, right? Look, Abraham, there's my promise. I kept my promise. But I don't want to wait till then to experience it. I want to worship with my brothers and sisters from around the world now. And that's why one voice exists. We're getting a preview of heavenly worship. And our church can prove that the gospel is true. Because only God could make a diverse community like this into real brothers and sisters. We're not united by our language, our skin color, the nation of our birth, we're united together through our one Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's pray to him now. Jesus, good shepherd, high priest, word of God, you are the gate, the door, the way, the truth, the light. You laid down your life to open access to God's family, to anyone. We were once some of the lost people in this world, but you moved toward us. You came with a salvation that only you could bring and that we can do nothing but receive. And so thank you, Good Shepherd, that you came and found us, that we're now sons and daughters with full access to the one King who is our Father. Help us welcome others as we were welcomed by you. And we pray it for their good for our good and for your glory. Amen.